Thanks for coming to this panel entitled Leadership and the Legacies of the Arab Spring. Okay, let, let me first introduce our panelists and speakers for today. And I, I am not sure how well you know about you know, the giants and big names in this field, but I'm telling you that you are having the most you know, important scholars uh, from whom we can receive some you know, insights and advice and you know, wisdoms for the future of post Arab Spring Middle East. And I think that's the art of the Asam Plenum. Okay, let me, let me start with uh, Dr. Clem Moore Henry next to me. Okay, Dr. Henry is a chairperson of uh, political science department at American University in Cairo and also an emeritus professor at the University of, at the University of Texas at Austin. I, I am forgetting my school. <laughs> <laughs> and then he is an author of numerous books and articles and um, particularly in the book of Globalization and the Politics of Development in the Middle East. And Next to Clem is Dr. Dirk Van der Weyl, and he's a professor at uh, Dartmouth College, and he's also a, an author of several books on Libya. And in particular, Dirk uh, was the only Western researcher uh, living and working in Libya when the country was under the UN and US sanctions. So I was so glad to found, find out that um, Dirk could make it to the plenum because he has been really, really busy in serving, you know, political advisor to the, I mean, at the UN. But, but um, today he's presenting his personal point of view, not really representing the UN. And thanks for coming, Dirk. And next to Dirk is um, Dr. Micah Hudson. And he's a director of uh, Middle East Institute at uh, Singapore Uni uh, National University of Singapore. And also he's an emeritus professor at Georgetown University. And also, you know, Dr. Hudson is a author of several numerous books and articles and, you know, typically the book of Arab politics. That was, you know, one of my requirement textbook in my class with you. <laughs> and I am Ji Hyang Jang, a director of Middle East program here at the Asan Institute for Policy Studies. And today our panel will cover two topics and issues or themes. Okay, first we are going to go over about diverse and various aspects of leadership changes in say Tunisia and Egypt and in Libya and Libya in, in Libya and Syria, Yemen and probably Bahrain and Turkey and Iran and probably Saudi Arabia. So we are going to spend about 40 minutes for the first issue. And then we are going to move on to the second issue about so what is the most urgent state building agenda or project in those countries? in post-Arab Spring Middle East. So, okay, let me, let me clarify the issues again. Okay, first we are going to cover the completed leadership changes or regime transitions in Tunisia and Egypt, and upcoming, hopefully, leadership changes in Libya and probably Yemen and Syria. And then the changes of regional power configurations focusing on Turkey and Iran. So let, let's get started with the first issue. So Clem, could you please just start with mm -hmm. Tunisia and Egypt? Well, <coughs> first, uh, <coughs> Tunisia started the Arab awakening by a very astonishing uh, train of events leading in a very short time to the toppling of a dictator, uh, Mr. Ben Ali, who had been president of Tunisia since uh, 1987 when he constitutionally sort of made a coup against uh, Habib Bourguiba, the 
founder of, of Tunisia. Uh, and this experience, as you know, uh, found an almost immediate echo the revolution of January 14th in Tunis led to the revolution of January 25th, as the Egyptians call their revolution. And uh, I have here just a, a little uh, sort of briefcase that uh, kind of describes uh, the events of Tahrir as uh, People tried to depict them uh, a few months later. You know, revolution or democratic transition. Well, maybe neither, and we'll talk about that. But uh, these two countries did have in common the fact that they were the uh, entities which had the longest histories as states. I mean, without going back to the pharaohs and pyramids and so forth, just look at it from the 19th century. Uh, these are two countries which, before the European uh, colonial occupation, already were on the way doing a defensive modernization, imitating uh, Europe and developing what looked like state entities uh, with the help of... Uh, the Saint-Simonien, for instance, of France, uh, who helped the uh, uh, <coughs> Muhammad Ali in Egypt, and <coughs> various uh, uh, technical assistants who helped uh, Ahmed Bey in Tunisia. And these countries stand out in the region for their relatively high degree of state development. I mean, the only uh, one that could rival them at all, but from a distance would be Morocco, which uh, does have a dynasty going back to the 17th century, <coughs> a successor of earlier dynasties, and uh, the solid experience of a French protectorate and bureaucratic administration uh, since the early 20th century. Now, uh, this uh, fact of a sort of an infrastructure did, I think, uh, provide the opportunity for such rapid change at the top. Um, in each case, the, these were police states, Ben Ali and Mubarak, uh, but in each case, uh, the overwhelming security apparatus was absolutely uh, overwhelmed by mass demonstrations, which, you know, you could see from the outside on television, Jazeera publishing, you know, every day, every hour, the changes uh, that, were, that were going on. And the underlying uh, reason, I guess, proximate cause why the dictators could be overthrown was that the militaries were militaries that were part of actual states and uh, not family, clan, thugocracy kinds of operations the way we would see subsequently uh, next door in Libya. Right. Uh, and uh, they could not be told to fire upon their own citizens. And so basically that is uh, the story uh, now, within that story, we then get the second question uh, concerning leadership, which is, well, you know, after the dictator falls, what uh, is going to happen next? And here, you know, despite the sort of superficial similarities of, you know, the youth, uh, uh, the Twitter, the social media, the... Uh, mass mobilizations, uh, Arab awakening, Arab spring, all that, uh, there came to be very interesting differences in the transition processes of these two early birds. The uh, Tunisians uh, have made almost a textbook sort of transition to democracy uh, 
you know, it's too early to really say <laughs> definitively, but they were able to take all the right steps. Um, whereas the Egyptians, uh, until now, are still scrambling uh, because they've sort of mixed up the order. What do you do first? Uh, how do you engage in transition? Uh, uh, what do you do about uh, constitutions? Uh, uh, what is the process to be? They are still stumbling, although they've made some progress, which I'll come back to in a moment. Uh, the Tunisians uh, were able uh, to resolve the issue of transition, uh, which is inherently a very kind of vulnerable period because the transitional authority, by definition, since it's a transition, it does not have legitimacy. And yet you have, it, while you know these dictators are toppled, you're also having tremendous social unrest and, and you need government, to, you need order, you need stability. Uh, uh, well, in the case of Tunisia, they were able to just uh, use the existing constitution. Well, you know, there was a passage that uh, if the president uh, sort of is incapacitated or goes or something, then <clears throat> the president of the National Assembly, the parliament, uh, will be a provisional president for, uh, I think, two months. Well, they spun that into many more than two months, but the person they had... <clears throat> had been a kind of a figurehead under Ben Ali, who uh, was, you know, not really that, you know, as a figurehead, uh, not that controversial a character. He also came from a good Tunis family, and uh, he was able to work with the existing Ben Ali government, um, Rashid Ghanoushi, not Rashid, excuse me, the other, Mohammed Ghanoushi, the prime minister of uh, Tunisia, stayed after Ben Ali left, uh, and uh, the new president uh, was able to work with him, and Ranushi, a technocrat, uh, in turn appointed various commissions, including a legislative uh, constitutional commission, and uh, things were able to proceed. Uh, when the revolutionaries became impatient at the lack of change, well, okay, the prime minister had to go, but the president was able to pick his former patron in the old Bourguiba system, um, a fellow uh, who had great experience and who had not been tainted by the Ben Ali regime. The guy was 85 years old. He'd served as foreign minister under uh, uh, Ben Ali, but had retired long since. So uh, this fellow, uh, Kaid Sibsi, uh, was then able to take charge and with a certain amount of authority. Furthermore, the constitutional commission that Ranushi had formed was also uh, headed by another good Tunis family person, uh, the son actually of the uh, important uh, Zatuna religious sheikh, a fellow by the name of Ben Ashur. Uh, <coughs> this uh, the son was a <clears throat> lawyer who had been the dean of the law school in Tunis and had been uh, in difficulty and fired by Ben Ali. So he had a good reputation among the people. Anyway, the three of them were able to work and Ben Ashur from this technical legal commission was able to expand it to bring in elements of civil society which had contested Ben Ali earlier and along with prominent individuals they made kind of a transitional council. They set up an electoral law. They finally, they got through the summer, they had elections in October. Uh, the uh, largest uh, well-organized party of course was the Islamic opposition the Nahda Party, but the Nahda Party is a progressive party that uh, uh, insisted subsequently in constitutional deliberations, for instance, that uh, it would uh, 
uh, stick by the old constitution of 1959, not talk about Sharia law, things like that. So the, the point is you have a transition process. It's going on now. The Constituent Assembly is meeting regularly. Uh, you have a government, a, a new government, which is headed by a very moderate Secretary General of the Islamist Party. And uh, things continue. The economy is gradually, it's projected to grow at 2% next year after having lost 2% the previous year. The tourists are gradually coming back. I mean, I'm not saying that everything is hunky-dory, but there is a transition going on there. Uh, Egypt, by contrast, the big contrast was the army. The army in Tunisia, professional, American trained, sort of a, a, a stepson of the regime because the regime had relied primarily on police and the army actually didn't much like the regime. So uh, they protected the revolution, but they also had this tradition of absolutely no intervention in politics. They uh, simply you know, obviously the chief of staff was very important in maintaining law and order in the early days and continues to play a crucial role, but completely apolitical. Egypt, on the other hand, the heritage of Gamal Abdel Nasser, Revolutionary Command Council, its, uh, and its descendant, the Supreme uh, Council of the Armed Forces, uh, is an actor with a vested interest in its own right. It's not politically neutral. Uh, you have, as in Tunisia, uh, Islamists who have um, uh, actually uh, uh, different variants of Islamists have a majority in uh, the parliament which eventually got elected. The parliament was in turn supposed to create a constitutional council. Well, there's been all sorts of disagreements about the hundred people to draft the constitution. Uh, the supreme command of the army is still in command of the country. Presidential elections may or may not, probably will happen um, in uh, uh, May uh, with a second round in June, uh, which is probably going to be necessary, and uh, at which point the army theoretically withdraws. But it's been a very messy process, and we can talk about it more. I think I'm probably running out of time. You so are very on time. I, uh, but uh, <laughs> it, it, just the, the contrast is a, is a function of the uh, previous uh, structures. Uh, moving on to the other transitions, uh, without this state infrastructure, though, you've had a very different and messier kind of story, as uh, our next speaker, I think, can tell us. Well, thank you so much, uh, Clem. Uh, and I'm going to talk about what Clem just referred to a few minutes ago as the thugocracy in, in Libya. <laughs> Uh, and I should say, as uh, I was introduced, that uh, I spent quite a bit of time as political advisor to the United Nations, who's done a lot of background work um, as the crisis in Libya uh, unfolded. Um, and one of the, uh, the very interesting things in Libya is that if you, if you read kind of the popular press in general, you get this image of a country that's uh, uh, totally chaotic, uh, that is some... Uh, disintegrating uh, in many ways. Um, and I think if you've actually uh, worked in Libya, I mean, if, uh, if somebody would have asked me a year ago uh, when the civil war uh, was uh, really starting, you know, how far will Libya come in a year? I think myself, like many other people, would have probably predicted that there was a very good chance that indeed Libya would implode and that these regional identities and so on would resurface. Uh, and instead, what we've actually seen um, is some, what I would call some pretty steady progress uh, towards uh, integration, uh, toward creating uh, national institutions that have never existed in the history of Libya. Uh, and you should remember that Libya was a, a completely artificially created country at the behest um, of the great powers. Um, and I think a lot of that progress that has been made um, has been, uh, or should be laid at the feet, I think, um, of what eventually became known as the Transitional National Council uh, in Libya. And remember that the TNC, as it's referred to, um, is a provisional body. It's not elected yet um, at this point. Um, and the TNC very early on, uh, knowing or realizing that there was a potential uh, for an enormous amount of chaos in Libya, 
very early on uh, through a stabilization team uh, in Dubai and then uh, through a number of teams in Benghazi started thinking very systematically about leadership uh, in Libya. Now here of course is the big irony. Uh, Gaddafi, uh, Muammar al-Gaddafi uh, was traditionally known in Libya, he, everybody referred to him as the leader uh, or in his better moments the leader, the guide of Qaeda al-Mualim. Um, and in a sense, of course, um, he was indeed a leader, but he was a leader who pretty much destroyed the country and any kind of institutions that existed. And so as the TNC was uh, going through its exercise of thinking, uh, what can we do uh, to prevent a repeat um, of the kind of authoritarian policies that we've seen, they came up essentially with two questions. And the first one was kind of a historical question. Um, how did somebody like Gaddafi emerge uh, in Libya? Uh, and then the second question was, what are some of the challenges we're going to face if we want to avoid uh, somebody like Gaddafi, if we want to create a new leadership team um, that can uh, move Libya forward, knowing of all these difficulties that the country had? Uh, and in, in answer to the first question, um, how did we create somebody like Gaddafi? Uh, you may remember, particularly some of the older members in the audience, um, that Gaddafi, when he came to power in 1969, was uh, quite a popular leader. Uh, he was very charismatic. Uh, and of course, very quickly, that charisma uh, turned into some kind of authoritarian impulse. Uh, and the reasons, uh, as we had several workshops with the TNC, uh, or several of the reasons why we came up, uh, why Gaddafi uh, turned from this charismatic leader into this authoritarian monster, so to speak, um, was, uh, first of all, had something to do with Libya's uh, history. Libya had never really been a country, a unified country. Uh, again, it was created very artificially. Uh, it had something to do uh, with the fact that Gaddafi very quickly was able to organize uh, some of the security apparatuses uh, around him. Uh, but it had overwhelmingly to do uh, with two points that the TNC was very interested in. And the one thing was um, that this was a country that institutionally speaking uh, was uh, virtually devoid of any institutions. Um, that is, Gaddafi had deliberately, when he created his Jamahiriya, as he called it, done away with all of the institutions of the modern state. So there were no more checks and balances built in within that uh, political system. And in a sense in Libya, and that phenomenon, the deinstitutionalization of the country, uh, was added to immensely uh, by the fact, of course, that Libya um, was an oil uh, exporter and that a lot of these oil revenues uh, simply accrued to the government without any checks and balances um, and could be used and were very skillfully used by Gaddafi uh, in a, a very classic divide and rule policy uh, to keep himself in power. And so knowing this, uh, the TNC then uh, kind of started to think about, you know, what are the challenges as we want to create this leadership team that hopefully can do a lot better than uh, Gaddafi ever did. And the first thing, of course, not surprisingly, um, that they uh, focused on was these institutional deficiencies that existed. And so very systematically, both in Dubai, in, in Benghazi, they started to think uh, about creating all kinds of institutions that in a sense would provide some checks and balances against any future government um, in, in Libya, knowing, of course, that they would have to create um, a constitution uh, down the road. Uh, the second problem that they were very aware of and that they knew was going to be an enormous challenge was to create some sense of national identity within uh, the country. Remember, Libya never really had had a true national identity. Its identity had always been splintered either regionally, tribally, um, and so on. Uh, the third issue uh, was one of national reconciliation. Uh, you know, how do you deal um, with uh, people in a dictatorship that has lasted for 42 years, where essentially just about everybody, if you wanted to have a job, if you wanted to have a family, was involved with that dictatorship? Uh, at what point do you decide people have blood on their hands, uh, they're beyond uh, rehabilitation, um, or they're not? You know, a very uh, difficult uh, problem to solve. Uh, but then the, the central um, issue that they uh, focused on really had to do with this kind of patronage that had been created. Uh, and we, we had a number of workshops uh, specifically aimed at how do you prevent uh, what had happened during the Gaddafi period, that money just flows in uh, and it just gets spent by whoever is in power. Now, if there's one thing we know, 
uh, from other examples throughout the world that send these kinds of oil exporters once uh, popular uprisings, once coups take place, and um, that usually patronage patterns repeat themselves very quickly. Uh, and so the TNC was very aware of that and wanted to make sure um, they could uh, avoid that. And then the final uh, problem that they uh, really faced and that they wanted to do something about uh, was really citizen uh, empowerment. Uh, remember, even though the Gaddafi regime had uh, prided itself uh, on the fact that it represented people, that in a sense the Jamahiriya was you know, direct representation of people, the reality, of course, had been um, that this was a country with no real true representation, uh, with no real civil society um, at all. Um, and so as they went about this, uh, and this took about um, seven or eight months, uh, and you know, lots of conferences both inside and in Libya, um, outside uh, of Libya, um, you know, very slowly they started to, develop, to develop a number um, of mechanisms. Uh, the TNC um, itself, which was this provisional government once more, of course faced its own crisis of legitimacy, in part because it had not been elected, and of course elections uh, were one of the issues that um, they uh, truly wanted to push forward as quickly as possible, knowing full well um, that these elections would be a catch-22. Uh, because on the, other hand, on the one hand, that would give a certain amount of legitimacy to the government, but on the other hand, most TNC members realized perfectly well that the country, institutionally speaking, was not ready yet um, for really making those um, elections uh, meaningful. Um, and so in a sense, what the, the TNC has done as it keeps thinking about uh, its own leadership role and how to push that forward uh, is that, uh, not surprisingly, um, it has kind of muddled through. It has gone from crisis uh, to crisis. Um, I think it has um, settled a number um, of important issues. Uh, the one issue um, that uh, is, I think, coming to an end, although it could take a little longer, um, is the one uh, very specific issue that has faced the TNC from the very beginning, um, and that is that it didn't have the monopoly of violence, um, that in many ways there were over 200 militias that could challenge uh, the central uh, government. And so if Libya, in a sense, in terms of leadership, um, has taught us anything uh, or is in, of any um, help to the Arab Spring, uh, I would argue it, it is that, first of all, um, it has, the TNC has shown um, that in these kinds of transitions, um, that there are a large number of issues that need to be resolved simultaneously, uh, and you cannot do so. That, in a sense, the capacity of the government will, for a long period of time, remain unequal to the challenges that it faces. And so that government's leaders will have to choose and pick um, their challenges uh, one by one. Uh, the second point, of course, uh, is that um, even though a lot of uh, outside groups had warned the Libyans against these elections, they decided to go forward with it, again knowing that, in a sense, this was um, a, uh, a catch-22. What I think the TNC also uh, has taught us um, is that good communication um, is very important in any kind of transition. Um, and the TNC really made a major effort to at any point that a decision was made to inform uh, the public uh, and particularly to inform uh, the, the militias. On the other hand, it has also made uh, enormous inroads, as I mentioned a, a moment ago, uh, against these militias and is really um, very slowly uh, and, and again picking its battles one by one um, establishing itself um, as kind of the central um, authority. But one of the major points, again, that uh, the TNC made uh, clear to itself, and I think also to the Arab world at large, um, is that, in a sense, good leadership without good institutions that surround it is meaningless. Um, that unless you have good institutions that can put checks and balances on leadership, um, that that leadership could very well revert back to what Gaddafi um, had been particularly, and here we're going to go back to the economic aspects of uh, leadership, um, if there are no checks and balance against what happens to the revenues of a country, particularly in an oil exporter like Libya, that history can very well uh, repeat itself. And then the final point that I think the TNC, uh, in a sense, learned, and that is also important, I think, for transitions um, throughout the Arab world, um, is that in the end, um, international support, and Libya, of course, was a very good example of that, NATO, uh, the United States, the European Union, and so on, that international support uh, provides a measure of legitimacy um, to 
uh, a transitional government uh, that is virtually unmatched by anything um, that we've seen in the, re in the region beyond uh, Libya. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dirk. Is it thank your you. time, Mike? Uh, before I talk about the, the three difficult cases, uh, if you thought these were difficult, wait till you hear mine. Let me say, uh, f first, uh, I'm from uh, about six hours away at the National University of Singapore, where we've recently developed a Middle East Institute. Uh, we've published a series of small analysis pieces. This is the one that came out just a week ago, and it has kind of a rogues gallery of fallen <laughs> dictators, uh, some of whom uh, we have talked about, and another one we will in a moment. And I should also mention, for those of you that, that are really quite interested in the Arab uprisings, that. Uh, at the Middle East Institute in Singapore at the National University, there will be a conference on May 24th and 25th uh, on that subject, an international conference, and you're all invited uh, to come on down to Singapore and, and, uh, and participate and attend. I want to pick up on uh, the word uh, institutionalization that Dirk has uh, ended up with, because uh, it is left to me to talk about the cases that are still unfinished. And I want to talk a little bit about three uh, cases that seem so unlike each other, and yet in some ways they have a lot of similarities. And these cases are Yemen, Bahrain, and Syria. These are the Asian Arab uprisings uh, so far. And uh, when uh, Ji Yang asked uh, that we focus initially on the question of leadership, that struck me as, as really quite a good question to ask with respect to these three cases, because I'd like to suggest that there has been a leadership deficit both on the part of the incumbents in these three countries, but also on the part of the oppositions. And I think it raises really interesting questions about, you know, what is good leadership? How do you get there? Uh, and, and what are the problems in, in sort of acquiring it or bringing it about. And I think one of the main problems that is evident in all three of these cases and indeed in th throughout the larger Arab world is a, is a question that I wrote about many years ago and it's called the question of legitimacy. Uh, if, you, if you have legitimate leadership and if you can build legitimate institutions, you're a lot better off than if you can't. And unfortunately, I think in the cases that I'm looking at now, that we're all looking at, uh, they can't, they didn't uh, in these particular uh, uh, situations. Just to recapitulate, uh, in case you haven't been following this uh, in great uh, detail, uh, in Yemen, you might think Yemen doesn't belong here because the leader is gone. Ali Abdullah Saleh uh, has been uh, retired from the presidency to which he uh, ascended uh, in a most un unusual way back in 1978. Um, but the Ali Abdullah Saleh machine uh, is still there. Uh, his son still commands a major army unit. He's got cousins who are big, big in the security services and so forth. And so we have a very interesting situation uh, in Yemen where there's, it's been quite a bloody process over many months where you have uh, a transition, apparently, but uh, a new regime that is still, you know, uh, looking down the street at the remnants of the old regime. And, of course, struggle and fighting goes on. So uh, one has to look, I think, uh, if I can start with the uh, Yemeni case, at the interesting uh, history of Ali Abdullah Saleh, uh, an obscure military officer who happened to come to power back in the uh, mid-1970s after two of his predecessors uh, in newly revolutionary Yemen, because it had been a monarchy uh, before, had been uh, blown up, had been, been murdered. And I remember very well that we all were sort of counting the minutes waiting for Ali Abdullah Saleh himself to be blown up or shot. Uh, but that didn't happen until many years later, and of course it turns out he's actually survived, narrowly, uh, an assassination attempt. Now what is interesting uh, is that uh, this obscure uh, general uh, from an obscure tribe uh, 
with no, you know, with no prospects really, actually managed to fool everybody. And he was able to put together a coalition of uh, uh, family members, uh, key tribal allies, and military people to uh, uh, fashion a regime that tried in its way to institutionalize itself through building a single party, the People's, uh, the People's General Congress. Uh, later on, in the 90s, Yemen, remember back then there were two of them, there was North Yemen and South Yemen, the two Yemens improbably came together, much to the, to the delight of, of many um, Yemeni nationalists on both sides of the old British-defined border. And for a few years, really between 1990 and 1994, you might say that was Yemen's spring, because at that point, Ali Abdel Saleh now merged uh, with the South Yemen, which had its own single party. They discovered, well, here we have one country and two parties, and indeed there were other parties as well, so it was time for democracy. And for a brief period of time, there was democracy. And it was very interesting to be in Yemen back in those days. There were civil society groups, there was a freer press, uh, things were looking pretty good. And of course, at that point, Yemen was making a fair amount of money from oil. Things were coming together. Well, I can't go through the whole story, but uh, as time went on, and I think partly as a result of uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh's uh, 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 decision to adopt the Washington Consensus and neoliberal economic policies, uh, things got tougher and tougher for ordinary Yemenis. So an economic crisis uh, began to drain such legitimacy as, as the uh, president happened uh, to have uh, accumulated over those years. Moreover, Yemen being uh, a, a poor country, a, a, a mountainous country, a beautiful country ac ac actually, uh, but very much uh, divided and not really kind of connected to one part to another. I mean, the South had been separate for hundreds of years. The farther south, the Hadramaut always had a sense of its own identity. Groups in the north had their own particular sense of, of, of tribal, regional uh, particularity and so on. So in some ways you might have said that Ali Abdullah Saleh was a pretty, pretty good politician and he held things together, but as happens, it seems, with authoritarian rulers, power uh, and absolute power, as they say, tends to corrupt and corruption became endemic. Moreover, oil began to diminish and so on and so on. And Ali Abdullah Saleh uh, became more and more uh, arbitrary Yemenis who had had a taste of a degree of participatory representative government realized that all of those dreams had turned to ashes and we came finally to uh, an explosion which was very much triggered by the contagion, if you will, I don't mean to be pejorative about this, but the, the epidemic effect, this, the, the, the multiplier effect of the uprisings that you've just heard described in North Africa uh, were uh, surely something of an inspiration. So there's a leader uh, who had kind of run out of gas. Unfortunately, the opposition has a long road to, to walk before it can, in a sense, create a sense of coherence, legitimacy, and so forth. And why is that? Well, part of the opposition is uh, a prominent tribal chief. Uh, another part is a rogue military officer. Another part is an Islamist party that actually has participated, the Islah, in, in uh, previous Yemeni governments as a sort of junior partner. And then there are outliers, uh, notably uh, the, the Salafist uh, Islamic tendency, and then of course uh, elements of Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda clones kind of uh, free riding on that. And so what you have there uh, is a, an opposition that uh, has its own baggage and still lacks, shall we say, leadership. The present president, who used to be vice president, uh, has yet to demonstrate leadership, although I am told uh, he is doing the best he can under difficult circumstances.
I'll leave that, I'll leave that one at that. Let me move quickly to the other uh, two cases. And let me move to the one that seems totally different, uh, Bahrain. Why is it different? Uh, Bahrain is a Gulf country. Bahrain uh, is not a huge oil exporter, uh, hardly at all anymore, but it is very wealthy nonetheless, thanks to Saudi largesse. Uh, uh, it is a tiny place, only half a million Bahrainis on a couple of little islands uh, just uh, a few miles uh, over the causeway from eastern Saudi Arabia, from all that Saudi oil. Uh, and we have here another a, 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 a traditional tribal Gulf monarchy that does have historical roots. Uh, they're all, in a sense, descended from the tribes of Arabia, the Al Khalifa dynasty. But here we have, even though we have the longevity of this dynasty, which confers a certain legitimacy, the leadership that has been displayed over the years uh, has been uh, increasingly deficient. And I think the main problem in Bahrain, where Demonstrations are going on, I suspect, even now as we speak. Uh, it's been very bloody. Uh, it's created huge uh, international outrage and so forth, but, but of course it's still there. And uh, what we find, I think, is a, re a regime that is not only a Sunni regime in a Shi'i population, a largely Shi'i population. I don't, I don't think that's the, the whole story by any means. It is also a regime that is regarded as, as, as uh, uh, in, incredibly corrupt. Uh, one who, uh, whose uh, prime minister, who is of course a member of the family, uh, controls and takes a cut of almost every economically productive enterprise in the country. Uh, and one which has showed a stunning lack of wise leadership as the protests have occurred. Because Bahrain, like Yemen a long time ago, Bahrain a long time ago, more than once, had its own previous democratic liberal uprisings uh, in the 50s, suppressed. In the 70s, suppressed again. In the 90s, suppressed. Bahrainis, in general, being the most educated, uh, very skilled manpower, little population doing extremely well, sort of cutting edge. They wanted, they wanted better government, and they were systematically denied. And it must be said that the degree of the brutality of the crackdown that has occurred and continues uh, really has, I, I think, uh, diluted such legitimacy as this traditional uh, monarchy had enjoyed. Now, there's one other thing to be said, and we can talk about this later, because th this, of course, is an ongoing case. There's no, no transition has taken place here at least not yet. And one of the main reasons is that the, that the big neighbor across the causeway will not have it. I've just, I've just been in Saudi Arabia about a month ago and talking to Saudi friends about this. And for many of them, they're saying, sorry, uh, we cannot, this is a national security issue for us. That's the main thing. We cannot have uh, one of our own, a member of the Gulf Monarchy Club fall or even be appearing like it might fall. We can't, that might really spread. That's a real worry. Moreover, according to the Saudis, this is not really a citizens uprising. It's a Shiite uprising against Sunnis. And so they have tried to cast this uh, in a sectarian manner. And there are some reasons for understanding it that way, but I think it would be quite incorrect to suppose that the Bahraini opposition is simply a Shi opposition. There are secular parties, there are Sunnis as well. But to be sure, the main opposition group is the al wafaq which is a Shiite uh, party. Moreover, say the Saudis, Iran's hand is not very far away. And as you can see, and this brings in the question of international involvement, which in some cases can help a transition occur, as happened in Libya, and in other cases can keep it from happening, which is what has happened so far in Bahrain. The Saudis will not have it. The Americans, of course, as usual, are ambivalent. Uh, because in principle, uh, the United States supports freedom and participation. Uh, in terms of interest, though, there's a large American naval base there. And the U.S., of course, has uh, a very key relationship with Saudi Arabia. So, so it goes. So in a sense, big powers play a blocking role. Uh, 
and, the, and you're stuck. So there have been legitimacy and leadership problems on both sides. No time to talk about Syria. <laughs> maybe, that'll, maybe that will come up. Let, let me just say that I would have continued the same line of analysis, saying that the, the uh, regime of Bashar al-Assad, successor to his father, Hafez al-Assad, uh, has shown uh, enormous uh, disregard for political realities and has, has pretty much drained such legitimacy as it might have had uh, away. But for the Syrian opposition, if you think the Yemeni opposition has got problems or the Bahrain opposition has got problems, wait till you see the Syrian opposition where it, it is really complicated. And we can talk about it if there's time. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, now, me as a Turkish expert to like to talk about not really domestic leadership, but more like a regional leadership configurations and changes. Okay, my question is going to be, can Turkey and Iran take a leadership in the region, I mean, in post Arab Spring Middle East? Okay, my answer to the question will be, Turkey might, but, but Iran, mm, not really. Okay, as we know, like most Islamist uh, parties have received significant political influences in post Arab Spring Middle East. And as we also know that, you know, Turkey's uh, Prime Minister Erdogan was ranked as the most admired leader in a 2010 poll of Arabs. And in, in those countries where many, you know, young Arabs have ousted their old tyrannies, the young Arabs uh, pinpoint, you know, point to the, you know, Turkey's AKP government under Erdogan leadership as, you know, a future model for, you know, the regional leadership because, you know, um, Erdogan is combining Islam with Western style representative democracy and he was very successful. So, so we are talking about, you know, politically democratic and economically prosperous and internationally also renowned Turkey, I mean, new Turkey right now. <coughs> and, and in those eight years of uh, AKP government, like Turkey's economy has grown like threefold. And also, you know, the infamous Turkey's no problems with the neighbors foreign policy has cultivated more, you know, like closer ties with their Muslim neighbors in the, in the Middle East and also like a Central Asian mu Muslim republics. And at the same time, uh, managed to keep Western alliance satisfied too. So I think Turkey can, Turkey might take a leadership in the region. And especially, you know, the Iranian, I mean, Islamic Republic of Iran just you know, lost the game of competing leadership with Turkey right after, you know, the, the Revolutionary Guard you know, crashed down so harshly the opposition movement right after, you know, the last presidential election in 29. And, and the country has, you know, proven that it, it cannot really ensure free, fair, and meaningful elections anymore. And, and you end up with, you know, classifying Iran as bully country right now. <laughs> so, so, yes, um, this is about my question regarding the leadership changes in terms of regional power configurations. Okay, now we are moving on to, you know, the second question. So what is the most urgent state building agenda or project that you and me can, you know, offer those, you know, countries including Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Syria, Yemen, and Bahrain and others? I mean, what can be the initial support in bringing about, you know, democratic, secure, transparent state with you know, able leadership. I mean, you pinpoint out, you know, the importance of uh, professionalized military. And Dirk was talking about, you know, the official and, you know, formal mechanisms of state 
structure, I mean institutions. And Mike was talking about, you know, the importance of legitimacy, and, uh, I mean, legitimate leadership, and, and, you know, independent of external influences of, you know, neighbors like Saudi Arabia and, and probably the United States. So, so please, please let, let us know what is the most important factor in state building process in those post Arab Spring Middle East countries. Doesn't it really vary, uh, you know, depending upon the context, there's certainly uh, no, uh, no one formula here. Um, I think that the uh, Tunisians um, are moving fairly well. Uh, it's not a question of, uh, you know, giving them any advice. They uh, have enough themselves to decide among themselves what their uh, direction is going to be. Uh, I believe that the United States and the international uh, financial institutions are, uh, at least they've said, they are very sympathetic to uh, these transitions, both in uh, Tunisia and in Egypt. And of course, uh, uh, Libya is uh, a major uh, uh, concern, given the oil and uh, uh, given the uh, NATO as well as UN uh, uh, involvement. Uh, for uh, Mike's uh, cases, <laughs> is there any uh, particular formula? Why, why don't you tell us a, a little bit how you would see Syria, uh, you know, the Kofi Annan plan of uh, talk, talk, and uh, uh, stop, gradually lay down your arms. How, how do you think that's playing out? Well, let me say something about the Turkish model, since the question of Turkey <laughs> has been brought up, because it might apply to Syria, and it certainly might apply to Tunisia and, and uh, to uh, Egypt and maybe Libya, uh, although I don't know a single Turk who believes that the Turkish model really will, doesn't even work in Turkey, but, but maybe I'm just talking to cynical academics, but the, there are two points about Turkey that are relevant. One is that under uh, the uh, AK party, under the Islamist, uh, moderate Islamist regime, uh, two things have happened that, that would might, might be very useful if they could happen in the Arab cases. One of them uh, is uh, putting the military back in the box. So military can be, when it's unleashed and uncontrolled and unaccountable, a big problem. And that's, that's a huge problem in so many Arab countries, that certainly that's true of Syria, certainly it was true of Yemen, uh, and, and Bahrain in a similar kind of way. So uh, the Turks somehow uh, managed to curb the special status and license of the military, and that was good <laughs> for democracy. The other thing that was good for democracy was that an Islamist party actually came to power and uh, seemed, uh, you know, to, to be not irrational, uh, seem to be, you know, reasonably, you know, reasonably popular. It must be doing some good things, and life goes on. In fact, life prospers. What are the lessons? Uh, well, you know, can that, can that can those th two things be achieved, a la Turk, in Tunisia or Egypt or Syria? I don't think so, and I think, uh, in fact, uh, Arabs with a sense of history uh, don't think that the uh, Turks necessarily ought to be the people that you should emulate, considering what uh, happened in the past. So that's one thing. Going going to the you know the question of state building, as you as you put it, I would say that in some cases uh, you don't want state building. You want state you want state downsizing, okay. and I think you want state downsizing in the ca in in perhaps uh, the the, uh, the the Tunisian the Egyptian and the Syrian cases, maybe the Bahraini case, downsizing and sort of opening up. In the Libyan case, no, I think there you, you, need to, you need definitely to build something up. But it seems to me, if I can revert to the question of legitimacy, that the 
the, 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 the terminology is not quite right. It's a, this is, you're using engineering terminology, state building, as if this is a kind of an erector set that you can you know, build, when it's really something that has to grow. It, it needs organic, moral support if it's going to really work. And I think that is the, the one thing that so far is lacking, uh, uh, certainly in the cases that, that I was assigned to, but I think maybe more broadly than that. The big uh, issue, I think, uh, in um, Egypt and in Tunisia and probably also in, uh, you know, I mean, Syria, it's different. It's, but uh, the distrust of some people for political Islam, uh, where here is the Turkish example, which admittedly in Turkey, things are also fragile these days, but they're working it out. Uh, Erdogan, when he visited Tunisia, he had a very warm welcome in the Nahda Islamist uh, circles uh, where they share, I mean, perhaps not literally the word secularism, but at least the idea of uh, let's keep the Sharia out of the Constitution, that sort of way. Uh, whereas in Egypt, um, the uh, Erdogan relations with the Muslim Brotherhood did not go down uh, very happily. And the other point about Turkey and Egypt would be precisely the issue of the military. The military has no intention of removing itself from the economy in Egypt, um, whereas, of course, in Tunisia, that problem is not raised. Uh, I mean, it, marginal uh, implications for the economy. In Egypt, the army really is a state within the state, economically speaking. Yeah. And so any sort of restructuring, a streamlining of the state, um, uh, if we go into sort of more neo deepening neoliberal reform, uh, the army, again, is, a, is an obstacle to that, as are, of course, a lot of segments of public opinion these days. So I'm, I'm not sure that the neoliberal ideas are necessarily going to work. Uh, I would say, on, on the other hand, uh, both these economies are open. You know, they need tourists, so they do have to kind of have a business-friendly uh, environment. And also, the real head, I mean, the guy who controls the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, is a big businessman. I mean, he uses actually his business connections to control the, you know, the party. But uh, that would augur in favor of uh, maintaining the uh, liberal reforms that others in uh, Egypt are uh, contesting. For what it's worth, we had a visit in Singapore. We hosted a delegation of Egyptian Muslim brothers who were coming to Singapore to learn about good government. Uh, and uh, it, this is all off the record, but one of them <laughs> said, uh, you can count on it, there's going to be a confrontation between us, the Muslim brothers, and the SCAF, and the army down the road. Uh, people think that we're in a kind of a tenuous alliance with each other. Well, maybe that's a temporary tactical maneuver, but down the road, there's, you know, we, we've got to put the army back in the box. The question is, how far back in the box? One of these fellows said, well, look, uh, we will guarantee them uh, immunity from future prosecution, and we will make sure that they get a good pension. Uh, but that's about it. But this issue of bringing the army under, you know, fiscal control, uh, parliamentary supervision, finance, and so forth, I've asked Turkish friends, you know, to what extent uh, the Turkish military establishment is really subjected to serious parliamentary scrutiny? The answer is uh, the army delivers a number, and that's it. There's really no serious discussion. So a lot of progress, it seems to me, is going to have to be made in Turkey. Uh, not to, I mean, in Egypt, it's going to take much longer. And in Egypt, you have another problem, which is that the army uh, in a way, you know, 
benefits from the incredible mistrust between the Muslim Brotherhood and Salafi movements on the one hand and your more secular, the people who are out there in Tahrir Square, the, uh, the young and, and uh, the, the, the more liberal-minded uh, uh, Egyptians. Uh, so for them, although they're committed also to getting the military under civilian control, that may be less of a priority than maintaining the military as a bulwark against uh, too much uh, Islamism. And uh, the Islamism in Egypt, unfortunately, maybe it reflects the relatively less educated society, uh, it's uh, far less progressive than the Islamism in Tunisia where these, uh, you know, the problem doesn't work the same way. Okay, um, Dirk, do you want to add something for Yeah, Mike? I, I mean, I, I very much like when Mike said, you know, that state building, and to go back to your question about state building specifically, I very much like Mike's comment, you know, that state building in a sense is organic, that, uh, you know, I mean, there's an element of timing to it. It, it takes a certain amount of time uh, to, uh, you know, and uh, of course in the Middle East, we, we in the West expect that this in the Middle East should happen overnight, you know, and markets tomorrow and democracy the day after. Uh, you know, which I can tell you, uh, particularly in Libya, it's probably not going to happen uh, that way uh, and, and for understandable reasons. So I do like that notion that timing is necessary, but on the other hand, uh, you know, state building is also uh, primarily about institution building, uh, and that does require some kind of hard constraints where you do uh, come in and actually create, help create institutions. Uh, and uh, again, I think both Mike and, and Clem are right, that, that varies enormously according to the kind of history that the different countries have had, the kind of institutional capabilities uh, that they have. And so in, in Libya, for example, to me it seems very clear because uh, Libya, as I uh, said in my earlier comments, uh, really has no history of state building whatsoever or, or the creation of state institutions. It, on the contrary, it has had a history of the destruction of state institutions. So in Libya, to me, it seems very clear the hard constraints there um, or the monopoly of violence that somehow you have to be able uh, to uh, give over to the state at that particular point in time. Um, the creation of kind, all kinds of mechanisms that allow you for accountability uh, and transparency, particularly relating to the financial um, aspects um, of the state. But then beyond that, John, uh, th there's another element I think that we tend to forget. State building is only one part of this. State building, again, is about the institutions. Uh, what a lot of uh, Arab countries also need beyond that is really nation building. That is that right. the institutions of the state must be seen as legitimate, that there must be a consensus around them. And in, in many ways, you know, yes, we're seeing uh, state building efforts, we're not seeing an enormous amount beyond that. Uh, and so the two, I think, need to go together. And hopefully in a country like Libya, where, again, they're paying an enormous amount of attention right now to this uh, creating of consensus, uh, of creating a sense of identity, um, hopefully the two will go hand in hand. But again, only history will show whether or not that really happens. Well, what you said exactly applies to the Syrian case, where I think you have an overdeveloped state mm -hmm. and a uh, a community that has uh, become paralyzed, fragmented, and, and sort of emasculated right. because of decades of authoritarian domination. The Egyptian, the late Egyptian political scientist Nazih Ayyubi uh, wrote a very fine book called Overstating the Arab State 20 years ago. Uh, and he distinguished between the strong, the weak, and the fierce. So Syria or Saddam's Iraq were fierce. Uh, they were highly developed, highly efficient, uh, but, but when, you know, uh, seized by authoritarian hands, uh, proved, you know, to be hollow and cruel. And I think this is, uh, the legacy of this is a huge problem for, for the, the, the Syrians, and it is complicated, if we can just add, go back to one other complicating dimension, it's complicated by larger global geostrategic and regional concerns. I mentioned in the case of Bahrain that those concerns are a kind of a blocking mechanism to keep a regime in power. Similarly in Syria, China and Russia uh, and Iran form a kind of blocking movement to keep Bashar al-Assad in power. But one of the dilemmas for the Syrian opposition, and they're divided on this point, 
is, do we really want NATO? Do we really want the Americans? Do we really want the Saudis and the Qataris uh, to help us overthrow Bashar? Because we know they have their own agendas, and this would contaminate a popular revolution. So what does one do? Okay, um, I, I, let me just add one more thing. Uh, I think like a state building does not really necessarily downsize or, or upsize the state, but rather, you know, the strengths, the ability to implement or say enforce, uh, you, you know, the rural laws and, and everything. But, but I, I don't know what can be the first important, you know, stimulating step. And, and, and I am looking for the questions. And okay, let, let us gather some questions from the floor. And okay, Dr. Go, please, um, please identify yourself. And <laughs> yeah, he is Dr. Go Myung-hyun from the Asan uh, Institute. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have a question for all the members of the panel. Uh, uh, you mentioned that, I mean, you mentioned uh, the military, the role of the military several times in preventing or speeding up the uh, nation, state building process or completing this uh, uh, Arab up uh, uprising revolution. But uh, from my understanding, uh, Arab uh, Spring uh, was, um, was caused by the popular uprising, right? It's a mass movement. And I think there's uh, quite a high chance that the mass movement to the, you know, the crowd in the, in the squares might actually for, uh, uh, appear, reappear again in order to disrupt or maybe speed up uh, the revolution. So, I mean, I would like to hear some comments on that. You know, this is maybe going to be a theme later on this evening about the basic changes that have occurred. But just let me kind of anticipate uh, living in, uh, in Cairo, you know, American University, we have a downtown campus, which is just by Tahrir. Uh, fortunately, most of our teaching is uh, out of the desert in, in the new campus. Uh, but uh, let me just say, it's very difficult to plan public events, which are so convenient in the downtown campus, because we never know the political weather, uh, nor does SCAF, which tries to respond to the political weather in various contorted ways, making contradictory decisions all the time. What this is reflecting, it seems to me, is precisely what you're suggesting. Namely, that whenever the government gets too far out of line, either uh, maybe uh, the security services uh, are making too much of a mess of things, or there's some decision uh, most recently concerning uh, presidential candidates. Well, what happens is that uh, the place is sufficiently organized now so that uh, Friday you can always bring out, you know, a few tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, the most recent uh, demonstration in Tahrir had uh, three different uh, uh, segments, all, you know, kind of demarcating themselves. Uh, the, the liberals, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, and uh, the Salafis, all complaining because various candidates were uh, being uh, removed or uh, manipulated. The point about this is there is now an available mass, and it seems to be becoming almost a habit, and this I think is interesting for, you know, the sort of structures that are getting in place irrespective. Uh, and this, I think, does mean more popular participation being institutionalized, and that in turn limits somewhat the degree of arbitrary government, you know, when and if the authoritarian regime gets reestablished. Yeah, it's really quite amazing when you look at the longevity and the bravery, the foolhardiness even of these of these people that yeah. come out. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking they're, of, they're, of they're the uh, I mean, the three cases I was talking about. You have ongoing mass protest, and you have to think that 
there was some profound psychological barrier removed and that it started in North Africa and yeah. people were so fed up and will continue to be fed up with arbitrary, corrupt, authoritarian rule that, that, you know, that attacks their sense of dignity that they'll continue to do this. And this runs right across the Arab-speaking region, I think, Indeed. thanks to Jazeera and uh, a common shared political culture. Yeah, okay, let us get just one more question. Nicholas Bozda from the Naval War College. One aspect of the Turkish model that was not addressed is whether or not Turkey's attempt at organic nation building, which was based upon ethnic homogenization, linguistic homogenization, religious homogenization, uh, how does that work in the Middle East? Do we, are we going to run up against a desire to see an organic nation building process that will run up against human rights concerns about the treatment of minorities? And how do we reconcile it so we don't end up with what we have seen in Bosnia, where essentially the international community has to act as the ward of the state in order to keep three ethnic groups in relative harmony. Uh, how do we do that, or do we simply accept that, as is already occurring in Iraq and elsewhere, that certain minority groups are going to be pushed out uh, in order to create more durable and lasting nations? Dirk, could you want to answer? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, first, <laughs> I mean, uh, this is, uh, thank you very much. This is, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it to Clem, but just in, just in a moment. But let me, let, let me uh, first of all, I think, of course, we're talking about a unique historical experience, the Ataturk experience, where you had, in fact, a true a leader, I mean, one of the very few real leaders that you've seen in the Middle East in, you know, over 100 years, uh, coming in with a kind of a, you know, a sort of French liberal enlightenment tabula rasa and saying, you know, we're going to wipe the slate clean and we're going to start over with this and that. I don't think that there is any conceivable way that particular model can be, or should be for that matter, you know, applied in, in, in any of these cases. And of course what we've seen in Turkey itself, is, as we all know, has been uh, a, a gradual I wouldn't say resurgence exactly, but, but a, a kind of a reemergence of, of claims to pu you know, public religious uh, uh, expression that has clearly modified the uh, Ataturk model. What you see in the Arab world, of course, is a place where, where uh, Islam at, at almost all levels is, is in fact even more deeply embedded and has not been sort of, no, no one's put the lid on it, really. I mean, there, there have been attempts, but, you know, it's, it's a more complicated case. So here we're talking, really, as we watch the Arab uprisings unfold, uh, uh, there is unmistakably going to be an Islamist character, uh, but will it be a totalitarian or complete or total is Islamist spring? I don't think so at all. And I, I think even within the Islamists, as you would have gathered from some of the comments here, there is interesting competition and, 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 and so on. So, but I think, I think it's, a, it's a, new, a new world that we're in compared to what Ataturk was dealing with. Yeah, and I just add that I think the, the contemporary Turkish model is kind of a bit the reverse. It's the reaction against your description of a leveling, sort of uh, unifying, uh, you know, Kurds or Mountain Turks kind of uh, uh, mentality. And uh, it's this, uh, shall we say, liberalization within Islam, within the uh, 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 Islamist uh, communities that uh, is the interesting lesson that Arabs are interested in seeing from Turkey and to what extent is it relevant to these other countries engaged in their political Islam. Uh, the Turks, I guess, have understood that the Ataturk model was kind of a, it was secular fundamentalism, if I may use sort of this uh, apparent uh, uh, neologism. Yeah, I said it like a radical secularism. Radical secularism. Uh, and it, uh, you know, that's not going to happen anywhere. Uh, uh, <laughs> 
Okay, let, let us just finish our session because it's almost like 3.48. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for participating. Okay, thank you.